Coming up on show 929, the Rivian pricing gets announced for the R1S and the R1T. Can you afford one? Also on the show today, the Ford e-Transit is unveiled and Mercedes-Benz are fuming after Tesla steals one of their top-level execs to build Gigafactory Berlin. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're listening in the world. Welcome to EV News Daily. My name is Martin Lee, going through every EV story so you don't have to. This podcast is designed, first and foremost, to save you time. If in 10, 15, 20 minutes a day, you can know everything you need to know about the world of electric vehicles... I consider my job done. Well, recommended videos to watch if you have the time. Firstly, my buddy Kyle Connor, who I do a Friday video podcast with for Inside EVs. He has been invited to Los Angeles to take a 20-minute tour of the Nissan Aria. And he's put that video online right now on the Inside EVs YouTube channel. A potentially very important car. If Nissan price it correctly and know their place in the market and know that they're not a premium maker, I suspect with the big battery all-wheel drive, uh, sorry, four tenths whatever it's called a version of the aria it could well be expensive and that would be an issue for finance but if they can get it in at a price that nissan buyers like could be a very important car remember the aria is not the new leaf it is a ground up rethink from the nissan engineers uh, they seem to have parked this one inside a painfully trendy loft apartment with stripped back brick walls it's also in the launch color which i will generously call copper brown there are other shades of brown that I could call it, but I won't. It's on the Inside EVs channel if you want to have a look at it right now. Secondly, another video recommendation uh, sent to me by two different people within about 10 minutes, which is rare, so I thought I'd better pay attention. And it's the brilliant Jason at Engineering Explained on his channel asking, why do bigger wheels mean worse efficiency when the overall tyre diameter remains the same? Coming down to aerodynamics, a 20-inch wheel causing more of a disruption in airflow than an 18-inch wheel, why aero covers are very popular on EVs, and why don't we just have a completely flat area covering like an aero wheel being a solid piece of plastic or, or metal? Well, find out by watching the video. I uh, highly recommend it. I'll pop a link to YouTube in the show notes. If that is, is YouTube working again now? Yeah. Oh, okay. I've been told it's working again after yesterday's outage. Okay, let's start with the Ford e-transit the ford a uh, debut of the all-electric e-transit happened only a couple of hours ago and i have to say of all the electric car debuts we've seen recently uh, the id4 mac e hummer cadillac lyric polestar honda e the e-transits is more exciting than any of them that's according to eric at jalopnik it's because the e-transit has the practical application that other evs don't offer vans can be used for short trips and are used widely for so-called last mile deliveries. An electric van completing those trips will have a meaningful effect on emissions since commercial vehicles contribute a fair amount of pollution to the environment. This is a really important point. This is why I talk about commercial vehicles so much. They're just not sexy because nobody really uh, wants to buy a working vehicle. I guess you could call the Cybertruck from Tesla, possibly a working vehicle for some people, and that has had uh, about four trillion pre-orders. However, most people don't really get excited about a truck or a van the way they would about a you know, sexy new car. However, think about, okay, I'll give you my example. My car has sat in the driveway for the last three or four days, and I thought, hmm, better charge it tonight. I haven't, I keep forgetting to charge it overnight when it's cheap rate. You know why? Because I don't drive it anywhere, especially post COVID lockdown. You know what I did today? I took the little lad out uh, about nine o'clock this morning and I picked him up about one o'clock this afternoon. That's it. Apart from putting someone in a baby seat and taking someone out again, that's all I've done today with the car. And so a commercial vehicle, if it's not often not always, often, if it's not moving, it's not earning money. Now, I know there's some, you know, Amazon slash delivery drivers who use their own vehicle uh, as contractors. I get that. But a lot of fleets have their own vehicles uh, leased and will be working on a shift. So three different shifts of drivers, but they're, they're working 24-7. Oh my goodness, it's why EV commercial vehicles are so expensive, uh, so important and need to be less expensive. And what do you think of the pricing of this one? $45,000, 
4,000 more than the combustion version. That is enough. That's it. Done deal. End of story. Because in the first year alone, you're going to save 4,000 in costs of not filling it up compared to electricity and petrol. So this is such an amazing price that Ford are putting the Transit on sale for. Look, let me check out the specs and then see what you think of it. Uh, Usable capacity in the battery of 67 kilowatt hours. Much, much bigger than the previous early versions of vans and commercial vehicles which some makers put out there with with terrible battery sizes because you know they're not aerodynamic they've often got a load in the back 67 kilowatt hours i think is a real sweet spot because any bigger and you're not going to be able to sell them for a reasonable cost or at least get them out on lease or, or business costs but anything smaller and no one's going to look at them. The Transit offers 217 miles on the European test test cycle, uh, but EPA will come in at less than that. Still, that's not fully loaded. But when you fully load this up, what's a Transit, gonna, a van going to be used for? Deliveries and work vehicles and things like that. It makes the e-Transit ideal for urban environments. Fixed drive routes. Oh, I've done Saturday specials on this before with companies that, uh, specialise in planning out routes for EV commercial vehicles. And trust me, these vehicles, they don't, they don't deviate from the route. They know in the morning exactly where that vehicle is going to go, often to within a very close time, and when it's going to get back to the depot. They know the route. They know the weather conditions. They know the uh, the geography of the area. So if you're driving up hill a lot, they can plan for how much battery energy is going to be used. And 200 miles is more than so many of these companies ever need on a day-to-day basis. Fleet owners don't want to pay for excess battery capacity that they don't need, which is why this is a great size battery. Uh, the vehicle is a proper EV. It's a proper electric vehicle. It's got things like preconditioning on the app or just that you know the time it's going to be leaving the de- depot. If the vehicle is then warm while it's plugged in, it's been charging and preconditioning, and the climate's been on, when you leave in cold temperatures... The vehicle doesn't need to use that energy to then heat the vehicle. E-Transit can reduce the cost of ownership by 40% compared to the combustion versions of Transit. 11.3 kilowatt AC charging, which is pretty good, uh, but for a bit of opportunity charging, but also 115 kilowatt DC fast charging, which is quick enough for a lunch break. You'll go to 80% of the battery in 34 minutes. That, in many areas that have mandated brakes for drivers... That's more than enough. We just need to make sure that there's enough chargers around conveniently placed, right? E-Transit features ProPower, which is a 2.3 kilowatt plug socket for tools and equipment on the job site, on the go. How many people, how many, you know, carpenters and, and tradesmen and women could do with, you know, getting the, you know, saw out of the back and putting it on a stand, plugging it into your van, and then you're off and away and working, not needing to find a source of power, not needing to use a generator. Such a brilliant idea. So simple, it, but not obvious when EV designers sit down to make an electric car. Uh, The battery is underneath the body. It means that the load space is all there, 15.1 cubic metres. Ford engineers have redesigned the driveline and rear suspension. It's rear-wheel drive, by the way, so when you've got a load in the back and it's slippery conditions or wet and icy, good weight on the back axle uh, for stability as well and better steering so in europe ford are going to have 25 configurations of this there's going to be a van a double cab double cabin van chassis cab body styles different lengths and heights a range of gross vehicle options uh, ma- gross uh, vehicle mass options up to 4.25 tons i think and that is so good that they've they have approached a commercial vehicle uh, with a lot of sense, and you can tell I get excited about stuff like this. Nobody else does. I'm sorry. I know that I'm a bit of a weirdo with stuff like this, but it's so important because these cars spew, these vans spew infinitely more emissions, coming back to the beginning of the story, than your car or my car. Most people don't commute two hours to work. Most people are not road warriors. They are out there. Don't get me wrong, but the vast majority, and the car is parked I think the stats say it's like 90 or 92 percent of the time your car is parked normally where you live at the moment because of covid so brilliant working vehicles let's electrify them i can't wait for when my next amazon delivery comes 
and it's from an electric uh, vehicle. And and how funny is this? We have a, we have the milkman. We we get our milk bottles dropped off because I, I like I like it. I know it's in many ways old school and in many ways new and tree huggy because like people these days are like, oh my goodness, you can wash a milk bottle and give it back and they'll use it again. Yeah, funny that. It's what we used to do. Um, and so we have the milkman, and uh, which was uh, which is the joke about EVs. They're milk, milk floats. <laughs> Brilliant. Because, um, of course, in the old days, you know, lead-acid batteries and stacks of them underneath milk floats and they'd um, barrel around at five miles an hour. And then when we got our milkman, um, uh, when we moved to our new house, uh, I noticed they turned up in a diesel. Cause I could hear them uh, early hours in the morning, and I need to uh, try and get the motivation to look out the window next time I'm awake at four a.m. and and I hear them drop off the milk, or if I'm you know up and pottering about to actually look at what the vehicle is. But it's electric now, and that is brilliant. And so the more vehicles like this can be electric, the better. It just gives me so much optimism when these kind of working vehicles can become electrified. The rest of the it, or the rest of the dominoes, I promise you, will all fall into place. Okay, let's talk about a car that you probably do want in your driveway, and lots of people find very, very sexy. The Rivian, the R1T. T for truck, the R1S, S for SUV. According to information posted on the Rivian website, newly updated, the R1T, the truck, will come in three different variants. There's the launch edition, and it's $75,000 US dollars, and you can get it from June next year. We're just over a year away from that being in the hands of customers. So now we know $77,000 for the R1T in the launch edition. Maybe there's a federal tax credit that you are applicable for so that brings the price down to late 60s the adventure model is the same powertrain same battery size same specs it's just a change of uh, specification so the adventure model is uh, is the same mechanically uh, but you it's a uh, different bells and whistles that comes in january 2022 so we're 15 months or so a little bit less uh, just over a year away from that arriving and there will be an Explore model, uh, which is the base model, $67,000. And then again, you can take off $7,500 federal tax credit on that. According to Drive Tesla Canada, like the uh, R1S, the SUV, the truck comes in those variants. They both do. And so... What do you think of that pricing? I mean, I think that's really, really good here. For $1,000, you can reserve your R1T or R1S on Rivian's website. The first electric adventure vehicles on the road will be the launch edition. Uh, say, Rivian, it's important to visit the configurator and get yours in, they say, because they will deliver them in the order in which they are ordered. Although, caveat to that, I would add, yeah, but in the US first, right? So if I order one, they won't deliver, you know, if I'm number two... I won't be. Uh, they won't bring one here. Right-hand drive, no mention of that. We'll see normally many months after left-hand drive for obvious reasons. And if you want the launch edition, uh, you get the special launch green color. It's 300 miles at least. So they're promising at least 300 miles, but probably more for the launch edition. And the US deliveries, like I say, start June 2021. Canadian deliveries will start slightly after that's for the truck uh, for the suv the r1s delivery start in august next year uh, for the truck the r1t the adventure package adds functionality with a powered bed cover and remote monitoring system uh, also features premium interior uh, heated and cooled vegan seats the 360 degree audio system and if you want that like i say january 2022 for anything apart from the launch edition so let me know your thoughts in the comments on this and we'll see what you're thinking of the pricing for the Rivian. R1T, R1S starts at 67.5 and uh, the launch ones are 75 grand but you know I think the standout story here is, is the R1S, the SUV, because the truck is definitely going to sell in truck loads. I was always going to go there and say that, uh, because especially in the US, because it's it's a truck. And But the SUV, like, this is a very, very premium, luxury, long distance, 300 mile plus, quick, less than three seconds, 0 to 60 SUV. There's a lot of big 
vehicles like that in that space, that kind of Hummer size, that Escalade size, where I think if you don't want a truck, but if you want a seven-seat, three-row SUV, this Rivian SUV doesn't get as much attention as the truck because you know the truck's going to be a big seller. The SUV, actually, for, for 70 grand, it's going to be a really attractive proposition for a big SUV. And I think it's going to do damage to a lot of the existing big SUVs that are on sale. Uh, let me know your thoughts. Uh, so reports from German media in the next story uh, noted that one of Mercedes-Benz key manufacturing executives, they've named him Rene Reif, has defected from Mercedes-Benz to Tesla to build, uh, take up a senior position building Giga Berlin. Uh, they're currently in the process of really quickly at ludicrous speed building out Giga Berlin. The workers' union have got involved in this, which seems amazing, but I know unions are incredibly strong and important in Germany, much more than many other places. The workers' union called IG Metall are not happy about what they call betrayal. Now, there may be something lost in the translation here, admittedly, from German uh, to uh, English, but as far as I can see, the um, betrayal of this executive leaving a big German company to go to Tesla. According to Teslarati, while neither the individual or Tesla has confirmed the news, the union took the unusual step of announcing this particular executive's departure from Mercedes-Benz. Until now, been running their engine factory in Berlin, and as noted in a report from the publication Deutsche Welle, the union announced this, and I quote, defection in a press release uh, calling for action, protests at the engine factory uh, tomorrow. And the head of the, the union uh, in, in Berlin have been sh has been sharing sentiments about the departure of saying uh, it, it, it's a betrayal. Goodness me. Uh, so interesting stuff there that somebody very high up in, in Mercedes-Benz is heading over the road to go and build Giga Berlin. And clearly, it's a very exciting time to be joining a company that has a laser focus on electrification. And if this is this gentleman's passion, you never know, he might just be a, a complete EV fan. It's a job you cannot say no to. I wonder if the deal was done recently when Elon was over in Europe just a few days ago when he flew in uh, to interview people. Moving on. And final story today. Power Cell in Sweden has been given a further order from Bosch worth around a million euros to supply fuel cell stacks next year. The deal is part of a joint development and license agreement signed last year, says Electrive. Since April last year, Bosch and Power Cell in Sweden have been working together on developing and producing and marketing uh, the, the fuel cell stack for the automotive sector. Uh, the Power Cell S3 is what they've called it. And, for example, according to an earlier announcement, the company had signed a contract with an unnamed leading European shipyard for marine use, developing and supplying fuel cells for a marine fuel cell system uh, with an output of about 3 megawatts. Uh, the system is to be developed and delivered within three years. Bosch sees long-term potential in the mobile fuel cell technology business in the billions. Uh, Bosch has already made clear some time ago that starting with commercial vehicles, fuel cell drives would be increasingly used in passenger cars, according to them. And this is kind of where, perhaps ideologically, I drift apart from the hydrogen uh, proponents, those that, that see it as a future, because, look, I enjoy charging my car at home. I like having broken the shackles of having to drive to a place to refill my personal transport and not be at the mercy of what somebody else sets as a fuel cost. So I'm very happy. I've got a very big choice here. I'm not sure about where you live, but here we have a very vibrant electricity market and I've got a choice of providers. I use one called Octopus because overnight it's very cheap. So I charge my car overnight when I need to. I know that I can have PV installed on the roof and that's the plan that you know we've saved up. So we want solar on the roof and I know that I could then refill my car for free. You know, air quotes, free. <laughs> Cuz you know it's, <laughs> the panels aren't free, but I could do that. And I I like that. And I like that this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to break those shackles of having to go to the petrol station and think what's the price today. Yeah, and also, and also the fact that around the world it costs 
something wildly different. Like, our fuel prices are crazy high because something like, well, nearly all of it goes to the government in tax. So... I like EVs. I never, ever, ever want a hydrogen vehicle. I'll be the last person to buy one. I don't want one. I like charging my car at home. Thanks. But it doesn't mean that you have to be opposed to hydrogen technology in aviation, in marine, in commercial uh, settings as well. Uh, the interesting thing about these fuel cell stacks, uh, which they're developing in Sweden, it does sound like they're very highly customizable and t- to be able to stack them for commercial applications. So you can take the technology they've got and just put them on top of each other and multiply them and build them up as you need them. And for something like Marine, where you can have that infrastructure on the dock side and you can refill those vehicles pretty quickly, then I think it's great. Obviously, challenges with hydrogen, which, you know, that's a whole separate show for this. Ideologically, on social media, you'll find people who will argue till they're blue in the face for either side. I see both sides of that. There is definitely a place, in my opinion, for hydrogen because A fuel cell car is an EV, except the energy is stored waiting to be made into electricity on board. And yes, those vehicles are safe. Don't get me started. Those vehicles are safe. Uh, But the batteries are often very small. Another way of doing it is to have a small fuel cell stack, but a big battery. So you're mainly driving off battery, but when you're not using the power from the battery, the fuel cell stack is recharging it. Another way of doing it. Normally you get a big stack and a small EV battery which is constantly charging and discharging to provide that that peak power. And and so you know there are definitely opportunities for hydrogen and maybe I should make a whole show about it in the future because it is an EV. It is an EV as much as I never want one for my personal transport. It's got to have a place. Uh, I just don't know enough about it. So I'd like to learn more. Uh, let me know your thoughts on that. And that's your show for today. Well, there are 928 previous podcasts in the archive. They're all for free, because let's face it, I could never charge for this. Uh, If you want to have a look at how we do pay for my time to do this, it is via Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash EV News Daily. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be able to do this. So for five or ten dollars a month, you make a huge, huge difference. You will. You allow me to do this, to bring you the information, to hopefully bring this information to a wider audience so we can all learn a little bit more. I uh, invite you to check it out, but by no means do you have to. I've got some great premium partners, Phil Roberts of Electric Future, Brad Crosby, thank you, Avid Technology, Porsche of The Village in Cincinnati, Audi of Cincinnati East, Volvo Cars of Cincinnati East, NationalCarCharging.com and AlohaCharge.com, Derek Riley at the EV Review Ireland YouTube channel and Richard at rsimons.co.uk, the electric vehicle specialists. Any reviews you can leave on Apple... Uh, podcasts always gratefully received because it helps you know build the show and have a, a wonderful day whatever you're doing i'll catch you tomorrow oh and do remember there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid <laughs>